So in the short video, we are going to talk about the three different types of distributions that are going to be used in most of our hypothesis testing. This is not, in this brief video, this is not the definitive um, video to determine when to use what type of hypothesis test. Uh, but I'm going to do my best here to try to give you uh, most of the rules that are necessary uh, because you're going to have to decide when to use a z-test, when to use a t-test, and in my class I've made it pretty straightforward that we're going to kind of focus on sample size, but we're now going to get into situations where that might be exceptions to the rule. So let's first of all talk about the z-test. We're familiar with the z-chart that you used in the last unit, and the notation for this is that your average is going to belong, your, um, your sample average is going to go belong to the normal distribution, and you have your average and your standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So the most common indicator that you're going to have to use the z-test is if you know the standard deviation. If it's given, there's pretty much a, a fair likely chance that you are going to use the z-test if you know the lowercase sigma or the standard deviation. Another common indicator is that your n is going to be greater than or equal to 30. Um, now, exceptions to the rule. Now, uh, this is in a situation when you have less than 30 pieces of data, but you still end up using the z-test, is when you know your standard deviation, and then it says that we have a normal distribution. The story problems and the homework problems will usually tell you that you have a normal distribution, uh, especially since they're trying to push you in that direction of doing a z-test. So of course, the first thing, look for lowercase standard deviation, lowercase sigma. Second case is to look for a large sample size. And then, of course, we have a normal distribution. Now, when do we use the t-test? Now, the t-test notation is going to be x bar again, we're going to have n and our average of our group there, but in this case we have the lowercase letter s instead of the lowercase sigma and the square root of n. So our common indicator is that we don't know the standard deviation. We only can find s. That is our standard deviation of our group X. And we can put little subscripts there if we want to. Um, you can put subscripts here for the, the mu as well. The, um, the another indicator is N is going to be less than 30. Although I've seen homework examples where the N is less than 30 and people want to do Z tests and the N is greater than 30 and we have to do a T test instead of Z. I mean, it's... It, it can get a little maddening here and there, so I'm generally going to be pretty straightforward um, if something doesn't kind of fit these rules. But here's another exception uh, to this mix here. Um, if the data is under 30, there's a rule of thumb that if the distribution has no outliers, you can assume normality. So if the data is under 30, no outliers. So there are going to be some homework problems where they're going to show you um, a box and whisker plot. And you can measure the IQR, which, in, again, the reminder is if, you, if your IQR minus uh, IQR times 1.5, uh, then you subtract that off, away from your Q1. Okay, so your Q1 minus this and your Q3 plus this, and this sets up your outlier bounds. Okay, and then you're going to see if you have any outliers, and if you have outliers, then you're not going to be able to do the problem. But if you don't have any outliers, then you can assume normality and move on from there. So there's an exception to the, the, the t-test here. So again, in summary, if you have standard deviation and a big sample size, use the z-test. However, sometimes with a small sample size and knowing standard deviation, and if we have a normal distribution, you can still do the z-test. T-test. Well, if we don't know standard deviation, pretty much you're locked into that. 
The small sample size is great, that's another indicator to use the t-test, but also make sure that you have no outliers. Now, the proportion z-test. Now the proportional z-test is also known as the test for the binomial percentage. So the big common indicator in this proportion z-test is that you see a percentage tested. So the problem won't say um, the mu or the average is equal to 20%. It'll say like we want to test to see if 20% is the correct number of people who would agree about something. The notation is get, gets a little wicked and you don't really have to know this for the test, but this is P prime belonging to the normal distribution and we have p hat which is our probability of getting a success and our standard deviation is created by p times q hat these p hats and q hats divided by n now this hat um is a triangle you know without a without a line going across the bottom of it and i it's very good to kind of note what this p B, P hat is this is our probability of success let's say you have a 25% chance of being a high school dropout so P hat would be 25% and your failure rate of dropping out so you succeeded high school would be 75% so that would be your Q so if all of this just feels like a big old blur the good news is, is that your technology is going to take care of most of your problems um, another common indicator is p hat and q hat will be given in the problem itself and that's going to be given in the form of you know let's say 40 percent believe in this political affiliation and 60 percent don't so that's definitely telling you what p hat and q hat is p is the probability of success and q is the probability of failure now here's the exception now this is a rule of thumb that it's going to be tested on one of your homework problems um, there's a rule of thumb that you can assume normality, but you can only assume normality when things are kind of big. So what you have to do is test um, n times p hat times q. You multiply these three things together and see if it's greater than 10. Okay. Or if you don't want to think of n, p, and q, you can think of just in terms of n and p. So n times p hat times and instead of q 1 minus p hat which is you know that's how you find q you find q by taking the complement here now if you multiply these three things together and it's greater than 10 um, then you're you're good but if this fails so if this whole thing fails then you can't assume normality then you have to use your B, which is going back to chapter 4, the binomial distribution for our N, which is our sample size, and then our P hat, which is our probability of the success. Now you'll note that we didn't put the hat on these things back in chapter 4. And you're wondering, why didn't you put those on there? It's because there were actually no other letter P's that are going to show up. Um, but there will be in this chapter, we're going to actually have something called a P value, which is different than P hat. But if you need a refresher as to how to do this, this would be the binomial CDF on the calculator. Okay, it's the binomial CDF where you have your N, you have your P hat, which is your success rate, and then you have your target value X that you want to go less than or equal to. Um, so this is a lot. You probably just s sat here in the last five minutes just, you know, writing all of this down and still feeling a little bit like wow from out of nowhere but honestly the technology is going to take a lot of this out of your hands and what you're going to need to know is you're going to need to know your percentage which is going to give you your null hypothesis and then other aspects of the problem which will fit in very nicely and the calculator will lead you towards that but what these th these three types of problems let you do is the z-test lets you do a myriad a ton of great problems with large sample size and known standard deviations the t-test allows us to take small groups of data and actually use the family of curves 
uh, with degrees of freedom. I probably should have added that in there. So can you add to the case 2 t test the degrees? Whoops. Can you add this degrees of freedom right there? So the t curves based on degrees of freedom. Now again, this is just part of of your t test right here. It's not actually part of the formula of the distribution, but we should really add in this is the t curves based on degrees of freedom. So again, large sample size, z-test. Small sample size, and we don't know our standard deviation, t-test. Now, if we want to test a percentage, now we have the proportion z-test, and I'm excited the next time we meet and talk about this, we're going to get into actual hypothesis testing examples. So stay tuned to the next series of videos. I appreciate you sticking around for this informational portion of this lecture to just tell you what are we going to see next. Thanks again for watching.